till the bitter end, we get the sweet dessert. <laughs> so good for you for being here. You're in for a treat. Who's heard Dr. Will Tuttle before? Okay, then you know the others is going to be so great. Dr. Will Tuttle is an educator, composer, pianist, and writer. He's the author of the number one Amazon bestseller, The World Peace Diet. And he has been a peace activist and vegan for over 30 years. He's been called the soul of the vegetarian movement, the conscience of the animal rights movement. He's a good guy. <laughs> Dr. Tuttle is the recipient of the Courage of Conscience Award. His PhD is from UC Berkeley, focusing on educating intuition and altruism. He is creator of the World Peace Diet Mastery and Facilitator Training Programs. He's taught college courses in philosophy, humanities, mythology, and comparative religions. He is a former Zen monk. How many of those do we have? <laughs> and he's a Dharma master in the Korean Zen tradition, co-founder of the Worldwide Prayer Circle for Animals, and currently conducting a music, art, and education ministry with his spouse, Madeline, a visionary artist from Switzerland. And you can see her work here. So Will's books and CDs and Madeline's art will be available outside afterwards. It is my great pleasure to bring you the soul of the vegan movement, Dr. Wiltel. You can just pull it out of the clip. You've got lots of corn now. Thank you so much, Victoria. I highly recommend the Vegan Main Street uh, program that she's doing in New York City. It's really a terrific way to spread the vegan message with people. All right, so this is great. So how many of you have read The World Peace Diet? I just have a feeling, so I, some of you, oh, quite a few. A lot of you haven't. Uh, this will be a talk primarily on some of the main ideas in The World Peace Diet. And tomorrow, I'll be talking more about how we can apply those in our uh, society today and transform our society. Tomorrow's talk is called Time to Wake Up and Social Transformation. And I, uh, the reason I'm here, really, essentially, I've never been to the program at VegFest, is to essentially bring the vegan message the way I feel is the most empowering to understand the big picture. And my wonderful spouse, Madeline, who is in the back, let's give a hand for Canal. She's been a so She's um, the artist in the, in the family, and I met her in Switzerland and uh, many years ago. We just had a 20th anniversary, actually, and uh, I was there in Europe uh, doing concerts for peace but in Russia. I met Madeline in, in, uh, in Switzerland and playing the piano. It was very interesting. She had said that, I found out later, that her whole life she'd heard a, a piece of music, a piece of piano music that was haunting her since she was five years old and she even had her own music uh, store and kept looking for this music and then uh, I wandered into this um, Waldorf school in Switzerland back in 1990 and was playing the piano and she said, that's the music I've been hearing my whole life. Whose music is that? That's my, that's my music. <laughs> and she ended up uh, coming over to help make the cover of the first album CD back in 1990 and we fell in love, got married and it's been Vegan bliss ever since. <laughs> but it's really an honor to be uh, to be with you and uh, and to see actually even in Switzerland that um, it's which is really an enormously um, beautiful country, but there it's basically oriented around cows. If you've ever been there, and I remember we went to a restaurant there and uh, we were trying to get a vegan meal, and finally the, the, the head chef came out and said to Madeline, "I can make you a meal with no dairy." And I can make you a meal with no meat. But I can never make a meal that has both no dairy and no meat. <laughs> <laughs> we had to go somewhere else. But <laughs> everything was under the cow. You know. um, but the, uh, the idea here for, for us, essentially, is to spread the vegan message primarily through beauty. And uh, through uh, understanding that the vegan revolution, which abs is absolutely mandatory and is uh, required in our society, is a revolution of love, 
a revolution of abundance, a revolution of compassion, kindness, a radical inclusion. However, the actual understanding of what uh, veganism is pointing to, I think in many ways, is excruciating to take the journey. How many of you have actually made an effort in your life to look behind the curtain of our culture's food uh, system? You see, yeah, a lot of you have. I know I don't understand. How many of you have not done that? You'd rather not hear anything about it. It's a little bit scary, you know. Nobody's raising their hand. How many of you never raise your hands? <laughs> I know it's. It is hard to look at behind the curtain of our culture's food system, but what I want to talk about with you today is what I feel is the most uh, exciting adventure a human being in our society can go on in, in today. And that is the adventure of looking deeply into our food system. Why is this a great adventure? The reason is anthropologists understand, and if you've read The World Peace Diet, you understand what I'm talking about, so I go into this in the first couple of chapters of the, of the book. But the basic idea is that anthropologists understand that the meals, the mealtime rituals in any society are, the, are incredibly important. They're the most powerful rituals in any culture. They're the primary, primary way that any society transmits its values from generation to generation. Meals are rituals, and the way we human beings are hardwired to learn something that we just never forget is through ritual. So eating animal foods at meals teaches us things and that are invisible and it's really a taboo to discuss. So I don't know if they're recording this, but I guess they are, so this is all taboo information. You're not supposed to ever think about this even, much less talk about it in public. But the thing is, it's enormously liberating. That's why it's a great adventure. Because essentially, I think we all know in our bones as human beings that we have a purpose on this planet. And for, our, for ourselves as individuals, as an expression of life, as, an, as a creative expression of consciousness. And we are born into a society that essentially at a very early age, we get, that gets hijacked. And we're taught that we have to fulfill our purpose essentially through consuming. And if we just consume the right amount of products and the right quantity and the right, the right brands, it will somehow attain happiness. <laughs> and but at a deeper level, I think we know that to uh, attain fulfillment and happiness, we have to understand ourselves. This is a, a, at the temple uh, at Delphi over the gate was the saying, Ganafi Sutan, which means know thyself. This basic teaching that is really at the core of, I think, most of the world religions, to know ourselves, to understand ourselves if we want to live our life with meaning, uh, with authenticity, and with a sense of purpose. And the thing is that we will never, I don't think, be able to live our life uh, in that way with self, real self-understanding if we don't understand the cultural program of whatever culture we're born into when we land here on this planet. And being here, understanding our culture's food program is really the key to understanding the culture that we live in. Looking deeply into our meals is a lens of looking deeply into the programming that we've all been injected with by the, from the time we were little infants. And it's the key to really understanding ourselves so that we can free ourselves from what in many ways is a program, an indoctrinated way of seeing the world that is absolutely not in our best interest as individuals and as a society. And the absolute devastation that we are wreaking upon our beautiful planet and on each other and on the opportunities really for future generations to, to live here uh, call us, I think, to understand this and to understand that we live in enormously critical times. So the ideas that I'm talking about here today to me are not merely academic ideas that sound interesting or maybe it's good for your health. I think we're talking about ideas that have to do with the, literally the, the I hate to say it that way, but the existence of our society and whether we can carry on and how we can uh, transform our world in a way that really makes it possible for us to do that. There's a fundamental, uh, I think, uh, awareness that we all have that it's time for us to change or die in the sense that if we keep going in the direction we're going with the kind of technology that we have, uh, which is able to devastate this planet and each other many times over, that it's time for us to make not just the minor changes to the way we're living, but major changes to the way we're not only living, but how we see the world. And this means looking at the food, because food is our most intimate connection 
with nature, with animals, with our society and our cultural uh, programming, with, with God and the universe, however you want to conceive of that. So this is why it's a great adventure. And it's, uh, in a sense, it's not an adventure for the faint of heart. It's really an adventure. It's a heroic journey in many ways that we actually look deeply into what's going on. And as we do that, suddenly we realize, and I think if we look carefully and, and uh, skillfully, we begin to see why we have the problems that we're having and why it's literally impossible for us to solve our dilemmas without going to the level of changing uh, our behavior around food. Animal uh, cruelty uh, is, is a huge problem in our, in our world, uh, but basically 98 to 99% of the animals that we kill and that we uh, torture, basically, uh, are, for, are for food. So this is where, and this is where most people are actually engaging. So essentially, the message that I'm here to give you today, though, I want to emphasize this point right at the very beginning, is enormously positive. It's a very optimistic message. I'll be talking today a little bit about some of what happens in our society now. Some of it won't sound very positive, and it's not. But the underlying message is very positive. And the message is essentially that we have the power, as individuals in our society, to transform our entire culture quite quickly. If we can transform this underlying um, behavior of the meal rituals, the mealtime rituals that we're sharing with each other, with our children, that will make a huge difference in our in all five levels. I talk you know, somewhat about the five levels of health. And we talk we think about health very often, we think about physical health. We're taught in our society to think about being healthy as being physically healthy, which is important. This is a great saying by Albert Schweitzer. He says, the key to happiness is good health and a short memory. <laughs> which I really love that. You know, but and physical health is enormously important and uh, it's a great, wonderful gift to have. Uh, but we know that psychological health is another type of health, and that's enormously important. We know that social health is enormously important. To live in a society that's, uh, that's crazy, you know, it's, it's hard for anyone. Uh, and then we know that spiritual health is vital. And really, spiritual health is probably the most important of all, a uh, sense of, of connectedness with the benevolent universe that we're part of and really understanding the truth that we are at a deeper level than just uh, identifying with a... Um, a finite conditioned uh, piece of meat, essentially. So, uh, and then environmental health, the, the key importance of environmental health and to live in a healthy world. So these, these are at least five levels of health that we aren't really taught to, uh, taught to think about. Uh, but the underlying idea here that I want to share with you, uh, with you here this afternoon is that the ramifications of our culture's food choices that we are virtually all of us are indoctrinated into, if we're born into any uh, kind of a family other than a vegan family. How many of you were born into a vegan family? Besides that, that's, okay, I don't see one hand. <laughs> yeah, so all of us have had to endure uh, the situation of being forced not only to witness people, adults, the people, you know, our parents and, and neighbors and relatives and and uh, teachers and ministers and you know, religious leaders and media people, anything, um, eating the flesh of, of animals who were uh, confined and tortured and killed, and, and their secretions, basically meat and dairy products and uh, eggs. Um, but, but besides witnessing, we, they made us eat it too, right? This is something that, that happened to all of us. I was uh, subjected to this, and I was also, <laughs> I remember, uh, when I was got to be about seven years old, I was the one that forced my little sister. My mother said, well, make sure your little sister, she was sitting in the high chair, make sure she eats her protein. And I was the one that, you know, said, you've got to eat your protein, you want, I don't want you to die of a protein deficiency. And my mother would blame me, you know, I, sometimes I wish, maybe, but no, I didn't want her, <laughs> want her to be healthy. And so I was, you know, feeding her the meat and I was modeling, I said, you know, I'm your big brother, I'm eating the meat, you know, I'm eating, it's really good, you've got to eat it too. And she always would go, <laughs> I always spit it out, and I said, come on, I make like an airplane, here comes the protein. <laughs> oh. You've got to eat your protein. <clears throat> you know, I'd be like forcing it down my throat. So I'm very happy actually to tell you all that my little sister is now vegan. <laughs> Yay. And my little sister's daughter is now a vegan. And my little sister's grandson is a vegan from birth. So things can change. <laughs> and even my mother is a vegan. She kind of, she read the World Peace Diet. She said, well, okay, I'm going vegan. So, <laughs> and Matt and Helen's mother too is vegan. So we have actually a pretty good situation finally at the family. But, um, but the underlying uh, idea here is that the ramifications of being born into uh, communities 
where we are eating, forced to eat animal foods, where that's considered normal, um, that this is huge. And I don't have nearly enough time today. I'll go, we'll go into more depth in some of these things tomorrow, but I want to briefly go over this with you now, the ramifications of this. The basic inescapable truth, which is a conservative estimate, is that, and you probably already are aware of this, but and I, won't, I won't dwell on it, but the basic inescapable truth is that we live in a society in the United States, in this country, in this nation, uh, we are killing every single day for food about 75 million animals. So this is just going on. This is routine, relentless happening. It's not a headline in the New York Times uh, with this shocking news. People go, what the heck happened? 75 million animals died yesterday. It's not news because this is something that we're just doing. But the good news is, in all of this, even though it's tragic, actually, what's the, the, the amount of suffering involved, in that, but the good news is that this is not something that's happening against our will, in a sense. This is not something that the government is just doing and we can't stop it. This is happening because we, the people, are taking out our wallets and we're saying, I want to buy this at the store and at the restaurants. And when we take out our wallets and we vote, we are casting a vote that is absolutely going to be counted. I don't know about the other votes, whether they're counted, but this is a vote that is counted. And so, the beauty of this understanding is that we, the people of the United States, and really of the world, as we begin to awaken to the ramifications of our food choices and make changes in our lives and vote for something else, other people do the same thing, and we uh, learn how to effectively begin to communicate this and share these ideas and advocate, then we can, I think, and I think it's happening, very quickly begin a transformation process that has to happen. So. I want to, you know, what's going <coughs> to probably end up happening here is you'll hear me speaking faster and faster and faster because I, I have way too more that I want to tell you than I have time for. The World Peace Diet is a book uh, we made into an audio book and it's 13 and a half hours and I have like less than an hour. So uh, <laughs> what I want to emphasize here though is just a few of the main points and, uh, and luckily we have tomorrow to go into some of the uh, ramifications of this for us in our society. The outer, I want to talk about the outer ramifications of this and then the inner. The basic idea is that when you have what I just talked about, a, a, um, a system that's killing that many animals every day for food, you have in place what is essentially a massive industrialized killing, feeding and killing machine. It's huge. We can't underestimate the extent of this. And this huge killing machine, unfortunately, reaches its deadly tentacles everywhere, right into the bottom of every ocean, right into the heart of the rainforest, right into every institution in our society, and really, for most people, right into every cell of their body. And everywhere it touches, it's, the effects are devastating, unfortunately. That's the truth. I mean, when you really look carefully at this, you see that this industrialized killing machine is based on violence, killing, reductionism, and the commodification of life. And what I'd like to do is talk about, just briefly, I wish I had more time, but just to go into some of the outer ramifications and then talk about the inner ramifications, because I think this is where it really gets very interesting. But the outer ramifications are, by themselves, enormous, and just being aware of this, I think, should be enough to get anyone to say, whoa, I'm gonna move toward a plant-based diet. The basic idea <clears throat> is that in order to kill that many animals, we have to feed them. And Al and I actually have been living in an RV for about 17 years with solar panels on the roof, traveling around giving uh, lectures and workshops. And most of North America, you're probably aware of this, has been converted into huge monocropped fields of genetically engineered corn and soybeans and now alfalfa, which are being grown not for people to eat, but primarily for livestock, for imprisoned pigs, cows, and chickens, and turkeys, and ducks, and geese, and increasingly huge amounts of imprisoned uh, factory farmed fishes. I know like we go through Mississippi, all this corn and soy, it's actually fed fishes, fishes on uh, in factory farm, uh, mostly onshore operations, also offshore operations, the catfish, trout, tell out the other ones that eat grain. So, <clears throat> and then they're feeding this, these fish to um, to other fish and, and to pigs and cows and chickens and so forth. But the basic idea is that this is enormously inefficient and wasteful. I mean, beyond, it, it's so, it, it is insane, really. There's this wonderful saying, I should maybe just say here, that I think is very important, um, by Krishnamurti. And he kind of sums up the dilemma that we're in. He said, 
At one point he said, it is not a good idea to be well adjusted to a profoundly sick society. Not a good idea to be well adjusted to a profoundly sick society. This is the tension that we feel being in the society. We as human beings are deeply yearn, we deeply yearn to be well adjusted to whatever social situation we find ourselves in. We want to fit in, we want to be part of the group, to be part of the tribe, to be part of the family. You know, we, this is how we get our, our meaning and our orientation in life. And yet as we begin to mature psychologically, spiritually, ethically, and so forth, we begin to say, wait a minute, this, I can't go along with this. This is for a variety of reasons. And so that, that's where the tension comes in. So we, we, we begin to question. And this is the greatest gift we can give ourselves and our society and everyone is questioning the official stories. All of them. Protein, calcium, I mean, and everything else. I don't even go into it, but whatever you hear on the meat, on the, my father used to call it the boob tube. And whatever, you, whatever we hear in the mass media for the mass news, no, that's not what's happening. But so, but questioning the official stories is so essential. And so, the basic idea underlying this, though, is that it's unbelievable. It's just enormously inefficient to be feeding huge amounts of grain to animals who basically convert it into four things: saturated fat, cholesterol, acidifying animal protein, and huge amounts of very toxic sewage, both methane gases, nitrous oxide gases, and and, and and, uh, and, and sewage. And so as we've traveled, we've seen the effects of this. And um, just the, the, uh, the, the monotropping itself is a war against nature where you don't let anything live except one species. And we see uh, just huge uh, disastrous results of this. We see birds and fishes and insects uh, dying, uh, the water being more and more polluted, both groundwater and surface water, and huge dead zones in the ocean expanding because of uh, hypoxia, you know, it's, it's, uh, um, it's nutrient-rich, so-called water from all the chemical fertilizers. And so we see this environmental devastation, the loss of topsoil, water pollution, and air pollution, but then that's just part of it. That's, the, that, that's uh, enormously devastating, but beyond that, we see the oceans are literally dying. I just read an article the other day, a book has come out talking about how Basically, jellyfish are taking over the oceans. They actually, scientists have a word for it. So it's something like the jellyfication of the oceans. But basically, fish, since, not, since the late 1980s, the fishing capacity on this planet has been increasing every year. We have now ships and technology. The fish don't have a chance. We, can, we have huge uh, ships with, with um, GPS and radar, sonar, and planes, helicopters, and they have gigantic. Uh, nest bottom trawlers that go on the bottom of the ocean with, with huge, um, larger than school buses, wheels that crush everything, bring up all, everything, fish and who knows what else, uh, bring everything up, mid-level trawlers, surface-level trawlers. So, but the, the amazing thing is, which is important to understand, is that every year since the 1980s, when, uh, since production uh, capacity has been going up, every year the actual catch has gone down is then less because they're just the fish are gone. And so all the larger fish species are basically teetering on the brink of extinction, tuna, <coughs> salmon, all so so now just for example in the United States, two thirds of the fish we're eating are factory farms. So we now have basically we completely decimated the ocean. But this is serious. Killing the oceans. We are destroying the oceans. We are taking all of the fish out. It's, uh, the oceans are, are are literally dying and uh, it's much more serious than I think we're being told. And, and then factory farm fishing contributes to that because, and this is the thing I think most people don't realize, the demand for fish is literally almost unlimited because we're not just catching fish to feed to people. We're catching fish to feed to animals. Huge numbers of fish are fed to other fish. For example, it takes three or to five or even more times you know, the amount of fish, uh, say pounds of, uh, of feed fish to get one pound of salmon, for factory farm salmon, for example. So it's very, uh, inefficient, but uh, that's what's happening. Or cows, for example, most people don't realize this, cows in the United States are actually eating more fish than human beings are. Even though it's comical to think of a cow running through a field and jumping into the street and catching a fish. I mean, I mean fish are obviously not food, natural food for cows, but scientists discovered a long time ago, actually, that if you, it's called enriching the feed. If you enrich the feed, of cows and of other animals by feeding them not just grass but grain and not just grain but flesh 
uh, cholesterol and animal protein and animal fat, um, then they will give more milk and they'll fatten up faster. So now fish are being fish meal basically is enriched in, in, in the, in the, in the um, in the feed of cows, pigs, chickens, and then cows are being fed now to, you know, to, to pigs and chickens, and chickens are being fed to cows and pigs, and dogs and cats, of course, they're euthanized, they all end up in there too, and roadkill all ends up in there. I mean, the whole system is basically, so when you're eating cheese, you're, you're eating cows, pigs, chickens, well, you're not supposed to eat cows anymore because of, fact, because of that cow disease that, that causes, but, um, but these very perverse practices that have been put into place because people basically figured out that this was a, somehow a way to save money, uh, it's causing not only uh, a lot of devastation to the health of the animals and forcing them into behaviors that are really bizarre and not according to their best interests, but also it's devastating to the environment. And we're overfishing the oceans completely and, and these factory farm operations of fishes, uh, I'm gonna get off this every 10 minutes because it's kind of depressing, but anyway, factory farming fishes is devastating because you have all these fish living in one place and they can't get out, they're in a cage, and, and all the feces goes down, and all the antibiotics and pesticides and herbicides they have to use to help the fish survive, because the fish are getting attacked by sea lice and other things that eat them from because they can't escape. And so it's just a war against nature, totally. This whole animal agriculture is com a complete war against nature, and it's a war against animals. They have always resisted from the beginning. That's why animal agriculture and plant agriculture are so different. The, you know, plant agriculture, we, are cooperating, but we do plant agriculture today like we do animal agriculture. It's just fighting and attacking and trying to beat nature. Um, but the basic idea is that with, with um, factory farm fishing, we're causing a huge amount of violence to the ecosystems uh, because it's so wasteful and takes so much, uh, so many resources to feed these fish. And uh, also, it's enormously cruel to the fish. And these large fish, for example, like salmon and other factory farming tuna fish. I mean, these are animals that are just glorious. They, they Mel and I remember telling me how she would, when she flew over the Mediterranean, um, you could see the tuna just leaping, you know, in through the, the air. They're swimming 40, 50 miles an hour. They're spending their entire life on cages, stuck in stinking cages, getting attacked by sea lice. And people are brainwashed into thinking that somehow this is healthy to eat. And we know that also fish uh, concentrate toxins in their flesh hundreds of thousands, millions of times more than is in the water. And the water's become very toxic because everything that we do on land ends up in the water. And so, and then I've seen the factory farm uh, fish operations on land where these, these swimming pools basically. And I remember looking in and thinking, well, that's interesting. There's nothing in there. It's just black water. It's just empty. And then I realized the fish were crammed in there. They were swimming and they hardly had room to move and they were swimming in their own feces and that's why the water was black and workers were dumping in chemicals and antibiotics trying to keep the poor fish alive long enough they could rip them out and eviscerate them and shock them and kill them. And then people again think this is some kind of health food. You know? So we have to realize the absolute um, uh, toxicity of not only of uh, these foods but also the environmental impacts and beyond that, there's a couple more things that we have to mention. We're in the middle of the, the largest mass extinction of species. So not only is this devastating to the oceans, but we're going into the rainforest now. For example, we're coming down by a conservative estimate of over an acre per second of Amazonian rainforest. I mean, when you cut down an acre, say, of Amazonian rainforest, this is not just cutting down a tree farm. This, these are webs of life that have taken millions of years to evolve, and they are incredibly complex, filled with all kinds of life forms, and we're just, so according to, again, according to uh, very conservative estimates, uh, we are looted. we are in the middle of the largest mass extinction of species in 65 million years, and it's driven by one thing, by humans taking out their wallets and paying for meat, dairy products, and eggs. The driving force behind the cutting down of rainforests is growing soybeans to feed to cows and also to pigs and chickens and factory farm fishes. And so we're losing, uh, as I was saying, according to conservative estimate, about 50 species every single day. And this is between 1,000 and 10,000 times higher uh, than the background um, extinction rate. So we are losing genetic diversity. And again, it's caused by the animal food. So when we look at all of this, we realize that if anyone is serious about actually reducing our environmental footprint and being more kind and compassionate to the world, to the ecosystems, to the, to the animals, to wildlife, and uh, to leave the planet for future generations, the most powerful thing anyone can do by far is to move toward a plant-based diet. Because according to the United Nations, for example, 
someone eating a, a plant-based diet uses one thirtieth of the water of someone eating a standard American diet. And that's again conservative estimates. So, and water is becoming very, very precious, and, 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 and yet we're using huge amounts of water uh, to, for animal agriculture, for irrigating crops, and we're never fed to humans. And uh, again, it, the, not only water, but petroleum use, land use, uh, pollution, all these things we can cut drastically by moving toward a plant-based diet. 20 to 1, 10 to 1, somewhere in there, 12 to 1, 15 to 1. So this is, a, this, you know, even though it's kind of horrific to think about this kind of devastation, it's also, isn't it, wonderful news to know that we can really amazingly reduce the amount of pollution we're causing. And, and, and underlying that, I think, is the idea that we live on such a beautiful earth. You've, I'm sure living here in Portland, you've noticed, haven't you noticed how beautiful the earth is? How beautiful the, the, the rivers and the forests and the trees and the flowers and the birds and the animals. And, I mean, it's an incredibly beautiful, precious celebration of life here. Who are we to come here and destroy the whole thing? I mean, what kind of entitlement, what kind of an idea is that, that, we, that, that we're entitled to just destroy everything? And yet that's what we're doing. We take, we take out our wallets and pay for this stuff. We're paying for someone to just cut down rainforest, stab animals. And what's really interesting to me, actually, when thinking about this whole thing, is that in the last few years we've had this kind of um, rejuvenation of this ridiculous idea that somehow free range and organic and out there living in the fields is, is uh, better for the end. First of all, we're killing the animals anyway. But what's, what we're finding is, uh, not only is it environmentally devastating, uh, for a variety of reasons which I don't have time to go into, but uh, we, there's a, a department uh, in, within the USDA called the Department of Wildlife Services. And the Department of Wildlife Services, which sounds like a nice department, right, they serve the wildlife, well, yeah, they serve them, they, they kill them. And that's what they're, they're just basically contracted by. They, any, any farmer, any rancher can call up and say, you know, I've got some coyotes here, I've got some prairie dogs here, I've got some starlings here, I've got, some bo I've got a bobcat, whatever. They're killing millions of animals. And it's, you know, from the air, from poisoning, all kinds of uh, trapping and everything. That's a war against anything except cows, pigs, and chickens. And so with factory farming, as horrific as it is, it's a natural extension of farming. It's a natural extension of the mentality of animal agriculture. It's nothing imposed. It's just, it's, a, it's just the way people have been thinking for thousands of years. And with that, you have these animals stuck away in these thinking sheds where nobody gets in. I can't get in there. You can't get in there. And for sure, a coyote's not going to get in there. But now that they're out on the land, we find that uh, much, you know, a lot more wildlife is being killed uh, because people want their free-range uh, meat. So the war continues, and the only way I think we can see we can become so obvious to create peace in our world with, with ourselves and the animals and each other and uh, future generations and, and, the, and the ecosystems is to awaken out of this killing trance that we've all been born into, that our culture is just engaged in. And so this is just a brief overview of the environmental effects. I want to mention briefly the cultural effects because I think, again, this is something that we don't normally think of, but the basic idea underlying this, again, is of the beauty and abundance of this earth. We are growing enough food to feed between 12 and 15 billion people. How many do we have? Anybody know, roughly? Seven. Right, seven billion, maybe a little more. So how is it we, we're growing enough food to feed more, basically more than twice the number of people we have, and yet, according to all the estimates, Roughly 1 billion people, 950 million people is the estimate, are dying or severely suffering from starvation and malnutrition. They cannot get enough to eat. I mean, the, the reason is very obvious. We're feeding most of the grain and most of the legumes that we're growing to animals, which the wealthy elite, basically the, about a billion people uh, in, on the, in the planet, live in, economy, in countries with economies that are industrialized and are high powered relative to people who live in less industrialized economies that are not high powered. So it's relatively easy for us in industrialized nations of the world to just drive up the price of grain in the world market to feed to our imprisoned pigs, cows, chickens, and fishes, and drive it to a point that's just too high for these people, and they've been driven off their land as part of the whole thing. So they're starving. <clears throat> and so the irony of that whole thing is that while these people are dying of the diseases that come from just not getting enough food, just starving to death, or malnourished, um, we're, we find people in industrialized nations ironically dying from what I'm sure you've been hearing here this, uh, today, uh, the disease that come from 
basically turning what could be very healthy plant-based foods into saturated fat, cholesterol, and, and acidified animal protein, so that osteoporosis and obesity and diabetes and liver disease, kidney disease, and various forms of cancer, breast, prostate, and colon cancer primarily, and hypertension and heart disease and the autoimmune diseases, uh, dementia and uh, and Alzheimer's, and all these various diseases are all definitively linked now with eating diets that are high in animal foods. So we see that. This is causing cultural devastation, economic devastation, the cost of the healthcare system. And on top of that, we see very clearly that when you have a situation with rampant injustice, th this is rampant injustice. When you have some people that are living so high off the hog, they can just take most of the land, most of the grain, most of the food, all, you know, everything, and eat it, and feed it to their animals, and eat the flesh of these poor animals, while other people, they can't even feed their little kids that are starving you're not going to have peace. You can, we know this. We cannot have peace without justice, uh, without some basic justice. And yet this, the injustice is so obvious. And so it just fuels a, a, a war machine that goes along with the industrialized food killing machine, unfortunately. And then another layer of this whole thing that I think is very important to understand is that with this <coughs> vast killing machine that we've got in place, we have to have, unfortunately, whole armies of our brothers and sisters who do the work that we don't want to do, right? I don't want to stab the animals all day and so I can, their flesh will be available in little, nice little neat saran wrap styrofoam containers or, 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 or in a restaurant on a plate. So someone has to do that work and the, pre the people who work in slaughterhouses and factory farms, unfortunately again, have, as we probably all are aware, the highest rates of work-related injuries. They also have the highest rates of suicide, of drug addiction, of alcoholism, and also of spousal abuse and child abuse. We, we force them as a society to do the worst work. And we've been, not only have visited these places, stockyards and um, factory farms and slaughterhouses, and it's just unbelievably horrific energy and violence there. The people that have to do that work, unfortunately, go back into their neighborhoods, into their families and communities, and do terrible things very often because they're desensitized, they're frustrated, they're angry, and they're stabbing animals all day. And they actually have a, a, a psychological name for this disease that they have, which is perpetrator-induced traumatic stress disorder. And so they have their they, the per, traumatic stress disorder, very often people just act out their, their violence. And so it just creates a web of violence. And so that it ripples out into the entire society on, on many levels. And so I think the basic thing here, not to get everybody depressed here, but I think we have to realize this is what's happening when you're killing that many animals and you have to do that, that um, as, as Martin Luther King, I think, very wisely said, and I think many other great uh, people have said the same thing, he said, violence anywhere hurts everyone everywhere because we're all interconnected. This basic truth, whenever we hear that, we go, yep, yeah, we know that's true. We know the basic teaching at the heart of veganism is of the interconnectedness of all life and the interconnectedness of the welfare of all living beings. So we're all part in the sense of communities that are interrelated. And so the basic teaching at the heart of veganism is the same teaching. It is just the reverse of that, which is compassion and kindness and mercy and tenderness and benevolence anywhere helps everyone everywhere because we're all interconnected. Each one of us does make a difference. If someone says, I don't, I don't make a difference, that's ridiculous. I mean, when we take out our wallet and we pay for something, when we open our mouth and we say something, whatever we're doing, we are sending out massive, really, they're huge, ripples into the web that are very often amplified in ways that we can't even imagine. So it's very important, if we want to be happy, that we send ripples out of love and kindness and blessing others, because it will come back. This is, the, this is really, I think, that the problem is that we are born into a society that is at a very low level of wisdom and of, of uh, fundamental uh, understanding of the universal principles. Every I used to teach comparative religion, and it's so interesting to see. You know, every religion basically teaches the same basic thing. They say the basic teaching in every world religion, and what I think of all authentic spiritual teachers is, whatever you most want for yourself, give that to others. This basic teaching: you know, if you want to be loved, then be loving. If you want to be free, let others be free. This basic idea: if you want to be just have a lot, be abundant, and be generous. We, this is the basic teaching, essentially. And we can perhaps fool the system for a while, but in the big picture, 
We know in our bones that what goes around comes around. As we sow, we reap. And yet, the thing is, we can tr mistreat other human beings, hungry human beings, slaughterhouse workers, future generations, ecosystems, animals, wildlife. And very often, they don't retaliate. For example, you can do whatever you want to a poor pig. You know, she's in, there she is, you know, and workers do horrible things to these poor animals, and then they're killed. And there's no retaliation. The pig doesn't sue us. You know, she doesn't get together a petition and demand that we get uh, fired from our position. You know, they just, they just suffer. They don't retaliate. And so we are, unfortunately, I think as a society, it's such a, um, a low level of real clarity about things that we think that, therefore, we get away with it. And we don't realize that our, even though the pig does not retaliate, in every case, our violence towards these animals itself retaliates. It always comes back, but we don't see it. We're raising a society to not get it, to not to disconnect the reality that's on our plate from the reality that you're getting on our plate. And so we don't see that their violence towards these animals comes back as physical disease, as psychological disease, as cultural disease, as environmental disease, and so forth. And so again, the idea is to realize that if we want to transform our society and actually have movements for peace, for social justice, for equality, for environmental sustainability, and all these noble things for freedom, then we are called to live it, actually live it, and not just blame the big corporations for what they're doing. Well, what are we doing? How are we living our lives? And that's where I think uh, our movements can really get powerful if we as human beings learn to embody what veganism is all about. And um, tomorrow I'll talk about my own journey, so I don't have time today. But, um, but it's fascinating to see that you know, when we go out of here and we see people going into restaurants and eating meat and dairy or buying it in the store and eating it and so forth, it's important to remember that there's only one reason they're doing it. The one reason is that they're following orders. They're, just, they're, fo they're not terrible people. We're, we're just following orders about eating, eating dairy and so forth. I'm just doing what I've been told by my mother, my father, my teachers, my minister, the priest, the rabbi, the, the government official, the doctor, you know, everybody. They, they, every institution in our society agrees, basically. It's just lately it's time to change a little bit. But typically this is it. So and it's very, and we, these are orders that we've gotten from the time we were tiny little infants. We go to any grocery store and just look at the baby food section and we'll see in their little jars of turkey and beef and chicken and even veal, which I think people must go, wait a minute, I'm gonna feed a baby to a baby? I don't know about that. But no, this veal isn't, I've seen veal, um, cheese, so forth. So this is, so we as little kids, we just, we're totally trusting these giants and what they're doing. You know, well, they give us, you know, we lose the breast if we're lucky enough to get it, which most kids unfortunately don't get, and we start getting food. And dairy and meat and all this stuff. And so that's what I want to talk about now, actually. The inner dimension. It's like I've been talking now about the outer ramifications of eating animal foods. On the outer level, there's nothing we're doing that's more devastating to our planet and to our culture than eating animal foods. And in fact, this to me is an enormous revelation. The revelation is we live in a hurting culture. I know you probably thought I said hurting, no, hurting, <laughs> hurting, H-E-R-D. -E. We live in a hurting culture today. And most people, we, we're never taught that. We think hurting, no, hurting cultures, those are the ones you know, where they have a bunch of sheep and goats and they're out there you know, in the field or whatever in the, in the steppes of Asia. We live in a hurt, the thing is we're not hurting them anymore, we just put them in prison. And we put them in, the, in jails and you know, in stinking sheds and by the hundreds of tens of thousands. But it's essentially a society that's organized completely around confining animals for food and other products and eating them and so forth. And it's in every house, it's in every, all of our, the fundamental rituals of our society, we, we are a manifestation of a herding culture. So when we understand that, we begin to realize the mentality that we have is the mentality of a herding culture. So what is this mentality? Essentially, we have to understand this if we're going to be able to evolve evolve to a, to a higher level and, and actually create a world where peace and freedom and justice and equality are actually possible. So essentially, the, the mentality that we have injected into us from the time of little kids, which is not in our best interest, is fundamentally, I think the core of it is it's a mentality of reductionism and commodification of life. Looking, learning to look at certain beings, not as beings, but as things. 
as uh, like, like we sell pork bellies in the Chicago Exchange like they're batches of cement. You know, we just learn to see pigs. We don't see pigs typically as a as as like like we see perhaps dogs or cats as beings with personalities. We give them a name. They they have uh, they have their own unique uh, drives. They have fundamental. Uh, how many of you have had a companion animal sometime? I don't have to say all. Yeah, most of you. So you know what I'm talking about. We know these animals have interests, right? They have interests. They don't like it if you step on their tail and they go, oh, get off my tail. You no, know, and they don't like it if we lock them into a, uh, into a closet and so forth. So these, have, these animals have interests, but in our system, their interests don't matter. We're taught that their interests do not matter. And we can only imagine for ourselves, I guess, I don't want you to do that, but how there's nothing worse anyone can imagine than to be, to be completely at the mercy of beings that are infinitely more smart and powerful than we are, in a sense. I mean, they just have total control of us, who don't care about our interests, who just want to see us as instruments that they're going to use however they want. This is, um, this is not, this is, this, but this is what we're doing. You know, as Jesus said, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. We have literally billions of animals in our hands, and we're not showing them mercy. We're, we're seeing them as mere things to be used. We, we, we reduce them. And we turn them into objects and into commodities. And so this boomerangs back. We find that we've created a society where we do that to each other. In many ways, unfortunately, and we even do it to ourselves. We try to present ourselves in a certain way so we can sell ourselves and get a good job and be attractive to a certain person. We, we end up you know, creating this whole commodification uh, mentality which goes very deep into our psyche. There's also essentially a mentality of, of disconnectedness. I mentioned this earlier, but again, every single meal, in many ways, is a ritual of disconnecting, of practicing disconnecting. <laughs> Adeline um, is from Switzerland, and she has this way of saying, I'll try to do my best here, Ubo macht den Meister, means practice makes the master. Whatever we practice, we will get good at. And we live, unfortunately, in a society where we're taught with every meal to practice disconnecting to just not make the connection between what we're eating and how it got there. We learn to, we get really good at it. And so we learn to stay shallow and not think too deeply about things because we're doing that with every meal. Food is our most powerful connection or with reality. We're eating this, this food. I mean, what you're seeing right here is a body that was made from I don't know, whatever's out there, tofu and apples and quinoa and spinach and so forth. But you know, I was talking to you right now. Uh, but the idea is, you know, the, uh, uh, our physical bodies are, manif are, are infinitely are created. So this is something we should really be aware of. And, and yet, the, uh, the fundamental idea here is that we learn to disconnect from uh, what we're doing. So my mother could, could say, oh, we're having bacon this morning, everyone. And I would go, oh, yum, 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 yay, we're having bacon, yay. So that I want two pieces or whatever. And if she had actually said what it was, and I don't want to gross people out, but if she had said just, you know, my, if she had put it mildly, well, we're going to have the flesh of a, of a little pig, an animal who, who lived her whole life in a metal cage, and she was driven into insanity because she was couldn't move, and she was banging her head against the bars of the cage, and finally they took her out, and then they killed her, and she was screaming, and now we're going to eat her flesh. I would have said, for breakfast? Uh, no, I don't, <laughs> I don't want to start my day that. Let's say something else. Let's have some, how about a grapefruit, or I don't know, something else. How about a nice green smoothie? <laughs> That's what we have now. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we don't know. I didn't know. I just didn't know. We don't know. We're forced into not knowing. We're forced, we learn to disconnect, to stay shallow. And when we practice that as an entire society, I'll talk more about this more tomorrow, but we basically create a, a society of people who are very naive and gullible, who don't want to look too deeply. And so we become very easily manipulated by a wealthy elite who controls the media, and they'll believe, they know we'll believe anything. And we do. We, we, we'll eat anything, we'll believe anything. I mean, come on. We have, to, we have to wake up here. So we have this underlying uh, injection into us by, through the mealtime rituals of a mentality of disconnectedness, and then also of exclusion, because we learned early on to just exclude certain beings from our circle of compassion. What veganism is, is the opposite of that. What veganism is really is the opposite of all of these. It's, it's, it's radical inclusion. It's saying, I'm going to include all beings within the sphere of my kindness and compassion. And when we do that, we begin, we, you know, that's why I think really going vegan, you know, eating, moving to a plant-based diet for ethical reasons is by far the most powerful single action any human being can do in our society today to create a new world where peace and justice and freedom are actually possible. It's, it's going right at the very seed and core 
of this culture that is devastating everything. And doing that is, you think it's easy, you go, oh, that's easy, well, it's so easy, then do it. <laughs> well, it's not that easy, I, you know, I like my chick, I like my cheese, or something, whatever it is. Um, but that is why it's so powerful, because we're actually saying no to this whole huge programming that we've been injected with of exclusion, disconnectedness, predation is another one. Uh, that we're essentially predatory. That we, you know, how, why do we create predatory economic systems that are with competition and domination by a few and so forth? We're not essentially predatory. We know that. How many people, when you see a squirrel, just want to rip it apart and eat it alive? You know, that's not our true nature. We're not, you know, it's ridiculous. And yet we're taught as little kids, you know, that we're predatory, not intellectually, but by, you know, by um, ritually. We're taught ritually that. And the other thing is very. Two more things. One is that. We're injected with a mentality of privilege and elitism at a very deep level because the subtext essentially of every meal is certain beings are inherently superior, that's us, certain other beings are inherently inferior, and it's the right and it's natural and just okay, it's good for the superior beings to exploit, oppress, and use the inferior beings however they want. Every single meal, we are just drumming that into our children, and we're reinforcing that ritually. And we're not only we're not only doing it on some sort of abstract ritual. I mean, then we eat it. We're actually eating this. This is what's creating ourselves. So, so we're feeding to our children. So we wonder. We have sociologists saying, by far the most dead, you know, devastating aspect. Oh my gosh. All right. Oh, I'm not even halfway there. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, okay, I'm talking in tomorrow. But the, uh, the basic idea is that um, uh, sociologists are saying that the most really the most devastating thing in our society in terms of our social health is this terrible in uh, inequality of resources where you know, we have people making so much money and other people literally barely have enough to eat or have a place to stay and we just allow that to happen. But you've got to realize every meal is reinforcing that in all of us if we're participating in eating animal foods. That's, so how can we create a society of justice and equality when every single meal is, is emphasizing at a deep level the opposite of that? And then the other thing, the final one on this, on this mentality that's injected into us, is it's a mentality of the domination of the feminine. Because essentially, from the very beginning of animal agriculture, it's always been the female animals that have been by far the most brutally treated because they are the ones who give birth to the babies. They're the ones who really men had to dominate with an iron fist, not just the female animals, but specifically their reproductive organs and the reproductive cycles. They had to put them like they do today on rape racks and inseminate them against their will. And then after nine months, for example, say in the case of a cow, she gives birth to this baby. She doesn't, you know, any dairy, organic or not, they don't want to do anything more than to just love that little baby and nurse the baby and protect the baby. And on every dairy, organic or not, that baby is immediately stolen. That's not your baby. You know, you, how would you feel? I mean, you give birth to a baby after nine months and they say, that's not your baby, that's my baby. And they steal the baby and then they impregnate him again on the rape rack. So they're impregnated and, and, um, and pregnant and lactating simultaneously, which breaks down the health of any female mammal very quickly. And so, whereas a dairy cow or a cow would normally live you know, 25 years or so, roughly, in, uh, in naturally, uh, after five years on any dairy organic or not, they are worn out and they're sent to slaughter, and one of the daughters will be who is a slave on the dairy will replace. So this is, this is to me, an unbelievably important because what this does, essentially, everyone who's living in the society, behind the curtain, and we have this curtain, like, and no one wants to look behind the curtain, like in the Wizard of Oz, you remember, say, don't look behind the curtain, pay no attention to what's behind the curtain. Well, if you don't pay attention to what's behind, this is what's behind the curtain. We have a society that's engaged in massive violence towards female animals, not just dairy cows, all the female, all the animals, pigs, fishes, I mean, they're all impregnated against their will, their babies are stolen, and this kind of violence towards female animals hurts all of us. It not only hurts these poor mothers, but it represses what I refer to in the World Peace Diet as Sophia. Sophia is the ancient Greek goddess of wisdom. The word for wisdom and the goddess of wisdom was Sophia. And the idea is that in all of these things, you have to understand this symbolically, Sophia is, represents the inner energy within ourselves, the inner reality, the inner wisdom within us that naturally yearns to protect life, to protect the children, to protect the babies, to protect the environment, to protect the community, and to celebrate our lives together in a cooperative way. And so 
by forcing us as little kids to eat the meat and the dairy products especially, what it essentially does is it just represses Sophia, the inner feminine wisdom, because I think we know in our bones if there's anything we should not mess with, it's mothers giving birth to babies and nursing those babies and protecting them, and yet that, in animal agriculture, that's the thing you have to dominate and exploit, and, and, um, and that hardens our hearts and suppresses Sophia, and when, unfortunately, when you have a society where Sophia is suppressed, like you do in our society today, and you have a society that's easily manipulated by a wealthy elite, where the people will allow this oceans to be destroyed and the rainforest to be destroyed and will allow corporations to come invading into our children's lives with violence and pornography and turn them into markets to be used and exploited for money. And so what veganism is essentially is the resurrection of and the rising up of Sophia, I think in many ways, of this feminine wisdom within all of us. As she rises up, she says, wait a minute, we're all interconnected. I want my life to be an expression of celebration, of beauty, of kindness, of compassion. I want my children to have a world that is healthy. I want my society to be healthy. And this is the essential wisdom of veganism. It's the essential understanding. And um, I, I realize I'm really close to the end here. I didn't, I don't know where the time went. But uh, yeah, there it is. You're right. It is. <laughs> time warp here. Um, so I'm just going to wrap it up here. I only have a couple more minutes. So and it's six o'clock. I want to thank all of you for for being here. And the, and so um, the, the basic message. You know, I've, I've talked a little bit about the outer ramifications. I've talked about the inner ramifications in terms of the spiritual, emotional, psychological, cultural programming that's injected into us. And so the the beauty of the message, though, I think that we have to understand, which is inherent in veganism, and uh, the founder of, of, of the word veganism. I think I understood this, Donald Watson. He said he coined a word, uh, the word vegan, back in 1944. He, he was the secretary of the um, Vegetarian Society in, in England, and he wanted a word that was short, because he was tired of typing vegetarian over and over again. And he wanted it pronounced vegan. That's why you can't, you can't say vegan, it's vegan, because Donald said so. Donald Watson. But he said, veganism is a philosophy and way of life which seeks to exclude, as far as possible and practical, all forms of exploitation of and cruelty to animals for food, clothing, or any other purpose. So it's basically this yearning to live my life, to minimize the violence, suffering, compassion, exploitation, and excuse me, the exploitation uh, and oppression of other living beings, both animals and humans. And so really what veganism is, I think in many ways, is simply living our own uh, values, our values of kindness and compassion. So I was really thrilled. Right after the World Peace Night came out, uh, he was still alive. He was uh, 95 years old, living in England, still very healthy, walking in the hills, but at one point, a friend of mine was going over there, and he was um, uh, doing an interview, he did a series of interviews with Donald Watson, you know, and he kind of, this, this grand old man who invented the word vegan, made such an impact on our whole society. And he called me from England the third time he went over, and he said, well, I just want you to know, Donald Watson uh, is not walking out in the hills anymore, he's not in bed. And he's telling everyone that it's time for him to go. He's had a great life, he was 95 years old, but you know, gotta go sometime. <laughs> And uh, so what he does every day uh, in, in the afternoon is he has his son-in-law read him the World Peace Diet. And he said, he's saying, this is what it's all about, what I was trying to say. And I felt, it felt like a, a really um, humbling affirmation coming from him because what I realized when I was in Korea as a Zen monk, I realized I was in a monastery that was practicing, it was, you know, since, since the year 1250 or something like that, no meat, no dairy, no eggs, no wool, no silk, no leather, not even killing mosquitoes. But they've been doing this for centuries. And I realized what veganism is, it's not some newfangled hippie idea uh, or some British idea from Donald Watson. It's actually an ancient wisdom that has been part of our humanity for thousands of years, that we've been born into a society that's forced us to forget our basic wisdom. But we, it's time to remember it. It's time to embody it. It's time to understand it. And there's nothing more important I don't think any human being can do today than, as I said in the beginning, to take the adventure to and make the effort to understand the underlying dynamic and then to bring our lives into alignment and make our lives expressions of this. Because I have to say, it, not only is it uh, supremely, I think, beneficial to others, it does come back. And I have to say, you know, like when I think about my own life and I think, like, what did I do right? You know, There's really two things I know I did right. One was going vegan, the other, I think, even better, I was, I was marrying Madeline. <laughs> and having, you know, having this, uh, the possibility, I think, really, of 
uh, of doing the best we can to minimize the, night, the violence that goes out from our lives and to maximize kindness and compassion. And I think as we do that, we just find our energy gets stronger. You know, I remember um, when we talk about the nutritional aspects of this, which I, I didn't get a chance to today, but I'll, I'll go into it a little bit tomorrow. Uh, how many of you have been to the Grand Canyon? Some of you have, yeah, oh, a lot of you, okay. Well, we were there like about a year ago, a couple of, a year and a half ago, and we, were, we had to live in our RV, we were camping on the South Rim, and we, we spent a couple of days and went down the Bright Angel Trail and camped, and then we came back up, and we had a couple more days, and I noticed how everywhere you go, there's uh, these signs that say, do not attempt to hike all the way down to the Colorado River, the bottom, and come back up again in one day. That's not a day hike. People die trying to do this, don't do it. So I said to Adam, I'm gonna try that. <laughs> Vegans are not known for following all the rules. So anyway, so I headed off the next morning, went down, no, 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 something like 5,000 vertical feet. Ended up finally down to, at the Colorado River. There's a sign there, of course, that says, no swimming. <laughs> right. I took a nice swim, came back, went all the way back up again. I was back up on the south rim again before noon for lunch. And I said, well, you know, these rules they make, they're just not for vegans. <laughs> Really, there's nothing to be proud of in that story. It's just simply, I think if we live in our life, I'm not going to be for 33 years, every day gets better. The food gets better. It's just, it's so wonderful to be living in accordance with this wonderful gift we've been given by the benevolent creator that our bodies don't, there's no nutrients that we need that we can't, that we need to kill animals for. We, it's, it's all there, you know. So to really understand that and live that, and I think that when our bodies are more clean and so forth, we have greater clarity, we have more confidence, we have more, as uh, Victoria was talking about, more self-respect, and we can begin to really be part of the foundation of the transformation of our world. And I think this is something to live for. This is something that will really work. So as, in closing, as uh, Buckman Sorvola said, he said, if you want to change the world in a positive way, don't fight against a corrupt order. Don't fight, just create something new. And that's what veganism is, that's why I love it. It's we're creating something new. New foods, new attitudes, new societies, new communities. We can create communities of compassion and kindness and beauty and just let that go. And instead of looking back at the past and how people already did it, look to the kind of future that we'd like to create and move in that direction. So I want to thank all of you. I know if you got in, came in through the door here, you're already on the path of beginning to question the underlying programming of our society, beginning to bring your lives into alignment with the truth that you know in your heart and soul, and that as you do that, you become part of the benevolent revolution on this planet, or the benevolent evolution on this planet that is veganism, so that we can actually live our lives as celebrations of peace and justice and freedom and equality and beauty and health and abundance on this gorgeous planet. There's nothing stopping us. We, there's nothing stopping us from living in this way on this planet. It's simply this inertia and the fear around it of changing our food system. So thank you all so much. Much love to you all, and uh, look forward to it.